Good, so welcome everyone. So it's a great pleasure to have Tonia Holock speaking here today. And she will tell us about low dimensional integrable Hamiltonian systems with S1 symmetry. Thank you very much uh, to, the organ to the organizers for um, inviting me. And I mean, is my sound okay? Is uh, the audio fine? To, not to yeah. everything? Yeah, it's just okay, fine. Good. Perfect. It's perfect. 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 Very good. Um, so, I mean, as the title says, I'm going to talk about uh, low dimensional Hamiltonian systems, in, uh, in particular integrable systems. And here with low dimension, I mean dimension four, actually. And um, the whole thing is some. At the moment, I mean, originally it started out as, a, as something I was just curious in, and then it develops into a larger program, as you see towards the end. And uh, since I wasn't really sure who was actually here sitting in the audience and how much knowledge people have towards Hamilton systems or not, and the notation and so on, I prepared a bunch of um, easy slides in the beginning. So, I mean, in case at some point people uh, start for asleep, please uh, warn me, and then I can go uh, skip faster ahead. So, I mean, I guess everybody knows that Hamiltonian systems are a large class of ODEs, and I mean, then named for well, William Hamilton. And they, that they are, um, so I say, that there are many systems that we just also know from daily life, let's say, that can be described by the Hamiltonian uh, uh, formalism. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, something I can also very easily visualize and uh, which also gives me uh, the opportunity then to draw a lot of pictures. And I mean, this talk, since we're having it over integral system, in particular also uh, is about the conservation laws, because uh, if I... Uh-oh. Did we lose Sonia? Sonia is still here. Uh, what did she? happen? What I did happen? Oh. I think, I'm not sure. You, you've stopped sharing. You need to start sharing again. I didn't do anything. I, I think maybe your it's... computer computer froze or something. I'm not, I'm not quite maybe sure. Maybe. Just, let's just maybe. hope that the internet is not uh, behaving stupidly. Let's hope the best. Okay. Brilliant. It's back, back. Yep. Well, let's hope the best. <laughs> Seeing me, my talk is not a conserved quantity uh, <laughs> by Zoom at the moment. Okay. Boom. Um, wait. Actually, I think the thing is now not in in the. Let me see if I can somehow get it here into the presentation mode. I think it's not presentation mode, right? Is it not presentation mode? It looks yes. fine to me. Okay, good, good. Let's hope that it stays that way. Um, I mean, as I said, I mean, Hamilton systems are quite well known system in the sense of that describe, uh, describe useful uh, situations and they have conservation laws. And they also can be used towards the calculus of variations, but usually rather when you reformulate it via the Euler Lagrange equations. So, um, and I mean, of course, you can also look at them in infinite dimensions, but then usually when it's talking about Hamiltonian PDEs. And this is something I'm not doing here today. So, we'll stay finite, and in particular, in the end, uh, always four dimensional. And let's maybe just uh, recall some notation. I mean, usually when you work in Simple so geometry, you are in dimension 2n and you have canonical coordinates. Very often they are called p and uh, q and p. So you have uh, q1 to qn and p1 to pn. And if you then consider a smooth function from r to n to r, I mean, you can uh, come up with a Hamiltonian vector field. Just if you write it down in local coordinates in the sense that you take the derivative, you switch uh, the partial derivatives and you plug here a minus. And uh, with that, you can get, I mean, then the standard uh, ODE for, of, for this vector field, which is then the Hamiltonian ODE. And uh, I mean, 
the nice thing about Hamilton systems is since this definition is so straightforward, at least in local coordinates on R2N, you can also easily compute examples. So I mean, here for for the parabola, I mean, you, you get uh, in fact the rot uh, rotations around um, the origin as solutions. So this is something which is nicely vi visual. And uh, if we go a little bit further and write it as uh, then without coordinates, this means we want to work on a symplectic manifold. And this means we have a two form omega closed and non-degenerate such that, uh, I mean, we, uh, what should I say, recover, I mean, in local coordinates, actually the situation we had before since uh, this, this are the standard double coordinates I was using in the beginning. And uh, moreover, I mean, this uh, situation out to Anna was using the very beginning is holds everywhere in the sense that when I'm in some black situation, uh, there's locally nothing uh, that distinguishes many folds from each uh, one, many folds from each other. It's a local normal form that always looks the same. And so in the coordinate free setting, then actually I can, since omega is non-degenerate, just uh, take here somehow the dual of um, the derivative of the one from the H under omega, and this is the Hamilton vector field. And well, then I get again the standard Hamilton equation. And when I then write it down in local coordinates, I get again the thing which I had in the very beginning. So, I mean, one can do it uh, abstractly or I can do it concretely with local coordinates and uh, it's just writing it down is no big deal. And what I also should say here, I mean, in the beginning, I said, I mean, I, I gave this local normal form, the nice coordinates. And this also means that when you want to do symplectic geometry for the sake of symplectic geometry, locally, you don't, don't find anything cool or interesting because you have a local normal form that thing tells you how, how the manifold looks like. So if you want to have something cool going on locally and not just globally, you need to look at other things like dynamics of an Hamiltonian function or something like that. And uh, this is, uh, as I say, then the only way to introduce something cool in the local sense. And I said in the very beginning already that we have en energy conservation and there's various ways uh, to explain this natural uh, property for, of Hamiltonian systems. I mean, on the one hand, one can say, well, uh, it simply means that the function is constant along its solutions. The other way to say it is, uh, well, if I take a level set and I start in the level set with an initial condition and consider my solution, then I never uh, run out of it. So, um, yep, what did happen now here? Here's something really going not going something weird. What is happening? This is really weird. Okay. This is not not a slide mode. What the hell is happening here? Let's see. Why is this you doing so something strange? Okay, let's hope the best. Mm, and I mean, you can prove this uh, simply by um, concatenating the function with the solution and calculating it and you notice that it's uh, zero. And it simply really means that the function is constant along the solution. And well, I mean, this also means that the solution is uh, has less freedom to move around in the whole manifold. I mean, if it has to stay in a level set, I mean, it has to stay in a set of dimension one less than the manifold or even more. And this means you gain information. And of course, the smaller the set uh, is the, uh, concerning the dimension where the solution may roam around, the easier it should be also maybe to, to calculate or to solve the system explicitly. And this is a little bit the idea behind um, the type of integrability that is usually used for Hamilton systems, namely um, the en energy conservation. 
that uh, this is what is here going on with my slide sharing. This is not normal. This is weird. Okay. Let's see if I, if I switch with these things here, it gets better. This is really, really weird. Sorry, I, I never had these problems before. I have no idea what's ha happened there. Maybe there's an update by Zoom that is not compatible with my Linux version. Oh, strange. <laughs> Maybe you can just scroll your slides. Yeah, let's let's see. I mean, I get, okay. Let's see. I try not to click here on on the thing below. Maybe that works. Well, I mean, uh, okay. Now, <laughs> in particular, it also means that when we're busy uh, in dimension two, we automatically know the system because by just looking at the level sets, because level sets are usually then one dimensional solutions are one dimensional. So, I mean, given a level set, you know where the thing has to run around. Meaning, I mean, here. When you start here in one of these uh, level sets here, you see they have to walk around like this. So uh, ah, that works. Mm, and so, I mean, of course, the question comes if one can iterate somehow this procedure in the sense that uh, if you have two metonian function, let's say, and uh, you look at the intersection of the level sets, can you find conditions such that solutions of the one also stay in the solution? in the level set of the other and vice versa and therefore stay actually in the intersection and this is I mean the concept one is looking uh, for when studying Liouville integrability so then one is just uh, looking at more of them and as I said uh, one traces uh, the intersection of the level sets and notices that the dimension drops and one can of course ask, I mean, can I go down to dimension zero? And uh, I mean, experts know that Arnold, Arnold Liebel uh, theorem says that uh, you don't gain anything more concerning information if you uh, try to find more than half dimension of the manifold. So it stops there at some point. But I mean, of course, the, pr the problem comes that uh, checking level sets and checking if the flow stays in them, this is nice with a picture. But it's uh, totally hopeless when you don't want to do it for a concrete example or when you want to do any kind of calculations. And so one needs to find a way how to um, express this formally. And the best way to do this is actually just by formally looking what is going on when I vary. So in the sense that I concatenate one Hamiltonian with a solution of another um, Hamiltonian system, I take the derivative and then I notice that I actually end up with both Hamilton vector fields here plugged into the symplectic form. And that actually is then the notion of the so-called Poisson bracket. <laughs> and so, I mean, therefore we're back here to our Poisson seminar. And um, I mean, I'm not doing any kind of algebraic things with this bracket as probably many people here in the audience do. So uh, for me, it's the thing is, somehow encoding this nice property that the level sets are compatible if and only if here um, the, the Poisson bracket of two Hamiltonian functions vanishes. Okay, then, I mean, this was the general situation in dimension 2n. And now I want to switch to uh, dimension four and actually come to the stuff uh, I announced, namely, uh, low dimensional integral systems. So we're now on a four dimensional manifold here, symplectic. And for me, an um, integral system or completely integral system to be uh, correct is a map then from the manifold to R2. So meaning I have here two functions, which was my H1 and let's say H2 in the previous slide. And they form an integral system if the Hamiltonian vector fields are almost everywhere linear independent and uh, if I have compatibility of the level sets, so I mean the Poisson bracket vanishes. And in particular, I mean, when I have this, uh, I can get a group action just by concatenating the flows. And let's also just assume that the flow is defined for all times. So, I mean, I want to really have a global action. I do not want to have uh, just a local flow or something like that. So everything, assume everything to be fine. 
And then comes, of course, the next question, a nice definition. But do we have some reasonable examples where we actually can see what's happening? And one easy possibility is uh, the coupled spin oscillator, which appears under various names, James Cummings or Godin and so on. And the other one is on um, S2 times R2 with some plectic forms, which you can scale uh, with, with uh, parameters. And what one is doing is one has here on the sphere a rotation and on R2 also rotation. And if you have this as coupled rotation, meaning that they're moving at the, the same speed, then of course you can ask for conserved quantities. And the easiest way to find a conserved quantity is uh, when you just take here, let's say the projection of our vector here to the um, horizontal plane through the origin, you put it here to the rotation in uh, R2, you consider the angle and you notice that when you have this kind of coupled rotation, the angle gets preserved. So uh, is this starting out from, from L, we found uh, our second function H and end up with an integral system. And uh, in addition, I mean, what one has here is, we will see it later. I mean, here certainly we have an S1 action because we're rotating. And the question simply comes if um, the other thing here and the whole thing together, I mean, then is S times S1 times R or is S1 times S1 or whatever kind of um, action is induced from the system. Because uh, this also tells you a little bit about uh, what kind of singularities may show up. Okay. And um, now that I mentioned singularities, let's maybe just say what they are. So I said in the definition, I want the two Hamiltonian vector fields to be uh, lin linearly independent almost everywhere. Equivalently, I could have said, I want that the rank here of my map is almost everywhere maximal. Coming here from four to two dimensions means maximal is equals to two. And so I'm critical if the rank is smaller than two. And uh, I'm a fixed point if the rank is uh, zero. And I mean, the next point of course is that uh, critical points or singular points, depending on which notation one wants to choose, they can be very nasty or less nasty in the sense of um, are they non-degenerate or maybe a little bit degenerate or very degenerate. And non-degenerate very often means that it's easier or they behave better, one finds easier normal forms. And this is more or less precisely also what one uh, uses here for the notion of non-degeneracy. I mean, one can define it in various ways. I mean, people here coming probably from the Lee, uh, back, uh, Lee theory background, what, he, what I'm displaying here, probably rather um, formulated via Catan subalgebras. But I prefer uh, this approach via linear algebra, which simply says, okay, um, fixed point is non-degenerate if the Hessians of the two functions here, L and H, are linearly independent. And if I can find a linear combination here of um, the Hessians multiplied with uh, the inverse of omega, uh, such that this linear combination has four distinct eigenvalues. And uh, this is actually quite easy to check. So if you have a decent example, you can do it either by hand very often or you stuff it into Mathematica. And so, I mean, this is much more accessible than the more theoretical one via cut and subalgebras. Another way somehow to say uh, what non-degenerate means is that you say you want to have this kind of local normal form. Because uh, if you're non-degenerate, it means that a singularity splits. So, um, the theorem actually holds in dimension 2n, so in general situation. And it means that uh, you could have elliptic components, hyperbolic components, focus focus components, or just regular components, depending on the rank of um, your singularity. And you can combine them. 
And then comes, of course, the question, uh, how does it look when you combine, combine them? Can you always combine everything? Are there obstructions and so on? And uh, we will see that uh, certain things it cannot happen when you have a global as one action, for example. And in particular, I mean, dimension four, you, the very moment you go for focus, focus, you have two components. So you have already two functions and you can't combine this with anything else. So um, that thing is then just already self-sufficient, but the rest you could combine. I mean, hyperbolic elliptic, hyperbolic hyperbolic, hyperbolic regular and so on. Okay, and I mean, then the easiest situation, of course, is if you are busy with um, torque systems. And there's also very nice to see how to study, I mean, from my point of view, at least uh, in global systems best in low dimension, namely, um, you have here, let's say, as an example, the CP2, you look at the standard, let's call it rotational, uh, momentum map of it. This is also the standard um, rotations you have on it. And when you then uh, write down the vibration caused by this map, you notice the following thing. First of all, I mean, the image here is a nice polygon. Second, uh, somehow here, the dimension of the boundary strata corresponds to the dimension of um, the fibers. So here over the vertices, you just have a fixed point over the um, here edges you have something one dimensional a circle in the middle you notice you have tori and so on and one can actually check this this is uh, also true also in the sense of the local normal form and even more important i mean here the situation that uh, we end up with with a triangle is um typical or natural for uh, not not turning, but but with some something with nice straight edge, edges is uh, typical for toric systems. And just remember that we had here a nice triangle for CP two, because uh, this comes or was proven then by the in nineteen eighty eight, so it's already quite a, <laughs> a few decades ago that when you have such a Toric system, also an integral system, where both, where all integrals are inducing. Then they are classified actually by the image of the momentum map. So if you go back here, that here is the image of the momentum map. And so this simply means then that, uh, well, CP2 this uh, let's call it decoration of the momentum map and its symplectic form, blah, 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 can be represented by a triangle. And Personally, I mean, I always thought this very um, counterintuitive in a certain way because, I mean, CP2 is a nice smooth manifold. And that thing here is a triangle that is determined by, I mean, you can just three points in space. And uh, this, this is something I, when I was a student, I never really could swallow. I mean, now that I know here this, the classification, it's much more natural, but nevertheless, I... Um, <laughs> it's still amazing to a certain extent. And so um, in particular, since it means that uh, with a finite number of data, you can characterize here this whole uh, tuple. And it also means that toric systems technically are doing, com com doing combinatorics. And this means that they are very, very special. I don't want to say boring, I want to say special because they're super nice. <laughs> and, um, but having something that is char uh, characterized by a finite set of data is of course not so, um, so say, interesting on the long term. So you want to know actually um, what more is possible because when you look at the torque system and then you look at uh, what you actually get in singularities, you notice that the only thing you can have is combinations of elliptic and regular components, and that's it. But the local normal form showed us that there could also be something like focus, focus, and so or hyperbolic, and this doesn't show up. So the next question is, how do systems look like that are toric plus? And the toric plus here 
is uh, the first step. So the easiest first step is when you go semi-toric in the sense that you say that you take an integrable system on a four-dimensional manifold. You want that um, here the first integral is given you in this one action. So I mean we're somewhat toric but only in one dimension. Here if the manifold is not compact you want to have L to be proper such that you get somewhere some compactness from to work with. And you want to have only non-degenerate singularities, fine, such that we have the local normal form. But I mean, when Von Gogh defined it here in 2003, he said no hyperbolic components, which technically means he allows focus focus, but nothing else. And he did it because, well, I mean, the very moment you admit hyperbolic, it becomes much more complicated. And this is what we will see towards the end of, the, of this talk. I mean, this is what what we are right now busy with. And this is, I mean, 20 years ago. <laughs> and there he was, uh, I think, very happy and proud that he could deal with um, toric plus focus focus. And so, I mean, in this situation, we have uh, the following uh, three types of singularities, two of uh, rank zero and one of rank one. And he, when you think in terms of um, a vibration again, here I try to give, give a picture. I mean, when you compare it to the torque situation before, you notice immediately that we don't have straight edges here. So that thing is curvy somehow. But nevertheless, when you check out, I mean, the fibers here over the vertices, well, we still have an elliptic elliptic fixed point, fine. Along uh, here, the boundary, we um, still have circles in the pre-image, fine, no change. But what one can have is some isolated singularities in the middle. And these are the focus focus values we have here and the fiber then looks like a pinch torus. And uh, I mean, of course one could have several pinches but uh, at the moment let's stick just to having one pinch. And uh, I mean, uh, Precisely, let's look, let's jump and go back. I mean, on the first glance, it doesn't look like a big step. I mean, it's, uh, well, okay, you have here something in the middle, isolated, singular, so it's, priori would say, big deal. But the answer is actually, yes, big deal when you want to stay as toric as possible, because, I mean, when you, um, say well okay here we have a nice elliptic corner and so on and here we have regular points so we could come and try to uh, put nice action angle coordinates here from the side and then you go from left to the right through um, the polygon and you try to uh, straighten it out and yes you notice oh yeah cool we get here something toric but the very moment you have here the focus focus point you run into the problem that um, well it has monodromy, meaning that you, when you circle around here, then the action angle coordinates, they jump. I mean, so, and this kind of jump means that uh, you have a jump in the lattice, but well, the jump in the lattice is not so bad. It's characterized simply by a transformation matrix, the monodromy matrix. And what Van Gogh noticed was, well, okay, when I just make here a cut into that polygon, and I observe what's happening here on the left-hand side with the edge and then on the right-hand side, then the uh, monodromy matrix just gives you the transformation here. So you get a fake vertex that is somehow um, telling you that here somewhere in the middle is a focus focus point setting. So from that point of view, fine. I mean, it's not that bad. But I mean, of course, the question comes how much more involved, let's say, are semi toric systems compared to toric. I mean, in the torque situation, we were busy with, um, with uh, only a finite number of data characterizing the system. So one can ask what's happening here. And well, the very first thing to notice, of course, is we should maybe uh, count how many focus focus points we have. The next thing one then notices is that these focus focus points I mean, these, these pinch tori, I mean, 
they have an influence on their neighborhood in the sense that of they distort space, not just now concerning uh, monodromy and so on, but of course, I mean, the whole vibration gets deformed and you want to see uh, how fast is that thing becoming pinched or not pinched. And the way how to describe that is by a Taylor uh, expansion of a so-called generating function that somehow models you this locally, the vibration. And uh, so this is one invariant. The next one is here, this kind of generalized polygon and technical equivalence class, because uh, you need um, to take uh, care here of choices and you could also cut from below. And so you need to um, formulate this choice as a group action and take the equivalence class. The next funny thing is that uh, this kind of the place where the focus focus point ends up after, after being um, straightened out here is an invariant. So uh, this has a meaning. And the last thing, which is a little bit difficult to explain is the so-called twisting index, which uh, somehow tells you a little bit how concerning torus actions, the small neighborhood here around the focus focus point is glued into um, the big uh, background torus action we get from the straightening map. And this is somehow the classification of the semitoic systems. And this was done around 2010 by uh, Pelion von Gogh. And I mean, I should maybe say here that um, they did it for focus folk, uh, for semitoic systems where um, only uh, single pinch tori were admitted. So they didn't want to have fibers where you, have, where you had several pinches in the focus focus point, but this was then solved, I think 2018 or 19 by a subsequent um, paper with one of their PhD students, with Joy Palmer and Xudi Tang. And so, I mean, if you want to look now for examples, we can actually uh, revive uh, the example at the beginning. So, I mean, the coupled spin oscillator that is, when we have a look at it, semi-toric because here we have again an S1 action coming from the rotation. And somehow the angle component, so here, I mean, the preserved angle, gives us a little bit more. I mean, at some point, I mean, we don't have a torus action. So um, here actually it's displayed. There we get a focus focus uh, value. And so therefore the whole thing is not toric. And I mean, this uh, Belay and Von Gogh already did, did here some kind of straightening procedure and then the polygon, uh, I mean, this is not that bad. What is really bad when you try to calculate actually Taylor series for that thing. This this is getting hard because uh, if you really want to get the coefficients, you need to invert Taylor series, plug them into each other and so on and so on. And for that, you need um, computational power. I mean, one of my PhD students did it then. And uh, I mean, this, this, this wasn't easy. I mean, okay. And the second example is so-called coupled angular momentum. So this technical means you do a little bit the same thing, but you replace here, I mean, there are two by a sphere on which you rotate. And what you also do is to, to have it a little more interesting, um, you have a deformation parameter. So you look actually at the situation where you rotate in both components, this coupled rotation, this is again our L here, it's just rotation. And the second function H here is um, a convex combination, more or less, between a rotation on the, on the first sphere and uh, the preserved angle. I mean, here this, this is a scalar product written in local coordinates. And I mean, scalar product is uh, how, you, how you can uh, characterize angles. And when we then look here, let's say, at the image of the momentum map, let's say for parameter t is one half, you see that um, here again, we get a focus focus point. And uh, this means this is also not toric, the system that's really semi toric. I mean, both systems only had one focus focus point. And if you have a classification, <laughs> it tells you it's first invariant, yeah, please start counting focus focus points. Then um, the next, next question is to ask um, how do systems look like that have more of them? To get this system, I mean, by a, I mean, this is constructed by a convex com combination here of a toric system and that angle thing. You actually let it walk in 
And this we can see on the following slide, I think, because together with Joey Palmer, uh, we um, then looked for a system that is semi-toric and it has two focus, focus points. And so we started out here from the coupled angular momenta, but we put here a couple of more parameters and we actually cut here the, um, the scalar product into two parts. And with that, actually for certain values, we could get such a shape here of the image of the momentum map. And I mean, you can actually per then reparameterize the whole thing only with uh, two parameters and then get a really nice picture and you see actually how the deformation goes. So, I mean, you start out from something that is totally toric. And uh, I think when one is going up here, let's see, when it's going up here, we get the coupled angular momentum. So this picture here, we had two slides before. And if you go here through the diagonal, this point, this point, that, which are elliptic, elliptic, they start walking in. I mean, very often this is also called Hamilton Hopf bifurcation, I think. So, I mean, this was possible. And then the funny thing was, we didn't know why it actually worked out, but uh, Joey then teamed up with uh, Johan Le Floch. They looked then at Hitzebuch surfaces and wanted to know what's actually really going on. And they noticed that, well, I mean, if you have a Dizon polygon, which is a Hitzebuch surface or a nice parallelogram uh, and so on, you can construct via Dizon's um, uh, classification uh, construction the according toric system. And then you can try to perturb the toric system and try to see how you need to perturb it. And the funny thing is then, well, I mean, the Dizon uh, construction goes via symplectic reduction. And normally one would think that the maps need to be super complicated, but in the end, very often uh, they're quite easy and the quotient isn't that bad, which the many uh, one is working then. And so, I mean, when they did it here for um, the Hitzebuch surfaces, I mean, they came up with various, here with some easy perturbations that were um, based on functions that leave the reduced space invariant. And uh, then the picture looks a little bit like this. So, I mean, they really could make also here a point just walking in and walking through. And uh, they did it then for a different one where they could uh, actually let two points again walk through here, those two. And um, so this somehow looked as if this is some, uh, something one can easy do. And what I should also say here is, um, I mean, the reason why we were busy with this global transformation is that the classification by Pillai and Van Gogh is a local patchwork. So you can lo you know locally what's going on, but when you patch something together with their, cl with their classification um, construction, you don't see anything globally. It's, it's, you cannot trace the system, it's hopeless. And so our aim was a little bit to find a way how to get from nice toric systems with some decent methods, something semi-toric and to have control. And here, I mean, one sees uh, that one really can have control. And then actually we, uh, together with Annelies de Möllenare, we wanted to have something fancier. I mean, so far now we know how to get several focus focus points. We know um, how to move them around, how to turn them from elliptic elliptic to focus focus and back, everything is fine. Now comes the question, I mean, in their classification, originally they only could deal with one focus focus point per fiber. So, so how do we get two per fiber? And the idea was then, okay, let's start with a polygon here of the where we actually have two vertices that are vertically above each other. And then let's walk them in. And this technically means you're busy, you're starting out with a simplex reduction from C8, but the computations are manageable. It's not that bad. And uh, you actually end up then with the following situation. So that what you really want to have the thing to do, namely here, these elliptic points to walk in, you get. And what's then happening is, I mean, first when they walk in here from elliptic to focus focus, you get nice pinch tori here over these points as fiber. And then when you let them really walk in such that they meet, you get precisely what you want here. So um, you have some double pinch tors. And the next question of course is, well, I mean, nice double pinch tors, but where's the thing? How does it look like? And so on. And I mean, 
this picture here, isn't this a little bit uh, idealistic in the sense that, oh, the thing looks so nice, so easy. Is it really so easy? And the totally unexpected thing is, it is so easy. I mean, here you see the plot. I mean, so this is not just, uh, I mean, guesswork or nice drawings that I did. So, I mean, you, this, this is proper and correct. And the funny thing is, you can write down the formula for this fo these double focus focus fibers. And here it is. I mean, it's it's uh, not that bad. I mean, you're on the quotient here coming from, from um, C8. So you have your eight components in an equivalence class. You have two parameters. I mean, you have the R and you have here the, um, the theta. The theta is rotating around that thing. The R is moving from there to there. And the plus minus tells you on which of these two um, lobes you are. And that's the formula. I mean, <laughs> so this is pretty nice. I mean, that, that one can do it so explicitly. Okay, now, I mean, I don't want to say we did everything one can do for semitoric systems, but we did a lot. I mean, so we saw how to construct them. We saw how to deform them, how to get more complicated fibers and so on and so on. And so somehow the time felt ripe for actually seeing what to do with hyperbolic singularities. I mean, we are now 15 or 20 years behind uh, the first definition by von Gogh. We are 10 years after the, the classification by Pelaya and von Gogh of semitoric systems. So, I mean, we should be able to do something. But the interesting thing was that our approach wasn't actually why, oh yeah, let's uh, introduce uh, uh, hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic singularities and semitoric systems and classify them. This wasn't what happened. What happened was um, the simple stupid question, if you have an S1 action, can you actually extend it to an integrable system? So can you find the second integral such that both together give you a nice, well, nice system. And the sense was nice now, I mean, if you take your first, your S1 action and you um, take a second integral zero, I mean, <laughs> of course they compute, uh, commute. I mean, you can always get this. You can also say, well, okay, but this is really totally degenerate. Let's get something else. You can also probably get that. The main challenge is to do this with the least mess possible in the sense that you want to find the second integral such that the singularities you have to accept for finding this are as good as possible. And so, I mean, in the end, we notice that we can get away with the following thing. So the class to which then Joe and I managed to lift is um, you, have on, you start out, let's say, with a four-dimensional manifold on which you have an S1 action. And then we can lift to the class of so-called hypersemitoric systems. And they are systems that, um, well, you st still have here your S1 action with which we originally started out. And on the other hand, here your combined thing may have any kind of singularities, um, non-degenerate. Uh, they, uh, they can have anything non-degenerate it wants to have. And the worst case scenario is that you have many, finally many parabolic ones. So uh, this is worst case. And parabolic, this is after being non-degenerate, the nicest class of degenerate uh, uh, points you can have. I show you a picture how one has to think about them later. But let's for the moment uh, here have a look at. So technically now from being semi-toric where we had elliptic stuff plus focus focus, we now can go, go to the full uh, Namely, we have elliptic, 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 hyperbolic, and focus, focus as, sing as fixed points. And we have elliptic, regular, and hyperbolic, regular for rank one. And normally now should somebody should cry out and ask, uh, where is hyperbolic, hyperbolic? Because this is not here. And it's not here, but not because we for forbid it. I mean, we said anything is possible, but the point is that when you have here in this one action, a global is one action, you cannot have hyperbolic, hyperbolic. It's just not possible. I mean, just think of um, in a classical situation when, when you have when you have just some kind of um, cross of axis and you have a classical uh, saddle, you have a saddle. Hyperbolic, hyperbolic means you have two saddles 
and they have this hyperbolic behavior that they, you run away from that thing. And then it's just impossible to get in any way a loop to close in this neighborhood and to close it always with the same period. It's, it's, it's impossible. And so this, this is the intuition why you cannot have it. And you can also, one can prove it. This is uh, not, not too difficult. And this is here what, what I just said. I mean, that one cannot have uh, the hyperbolic, hyperbolic stuff. Okay, now let's see what we actually introduced. And I mean, here I only show easy situations because it can get as bad as possible somehow. So, I mean, when we did this kind of extension from this one action to getting a nice integrable system, we actually only needed this phenomena. And this phenomena is the so-called flap, which means that the fibers, I mean, of your system are not necessarily any more connected. I mean, I didn't say it explicitly, but in all the pictures of the semi situation, the fibers here always only had one connected component. And this one can prove this, this is true for them. So there technically when you co collapse uh, the connect components of the fibers, you get the image of the momentum map one to one. So you have a one to one correspondence between the leaf space, leaf meaning the connected component of the fiber and the image of the momentum map. And here this you don't have any more uh, in the hyperbolic situation because when you have such an hyperbolic, uh, a line of hyperbolic regular points, the fibers of them actually look like uh, two tors uh, on top of uh, each other. So they're, they're technically touching along a longer circle here. And uh, when you want to get an intuition how this is actually possible, then this, you only can get something like that via, um, well, okay, when you pass through that thing here, coming with, with nice uh, single uh, torus in the fiber here, and you cross through that line, and you have here this kind of doubling up, then it needs to separate once you're through. So technically here, I mean, here the, the light uh, grayish thing, and then the darker grayish thing of the flap together, they give you then the two different um, connected components. And I mean, it's a called a flap because also say you, one could think about um, grabbing, let's say here this point, which is an elliptic elliptic point and pulling here this, the darker shaped thing up a little bit. And then one sees easy why one actually get then here two different components and uh, um, pre-image. And so technically here, I mean, I drew just these doubled, uh, this double tori here as fibers. And when you then here come to the endpoints, um, here we get these parabolic points and the parabolic points, sometimes they're also called cusp, uh, cusp points or cusps because when you look here, actually how this torus looks like, up here, it, it, it is teardrop shaped. It's like a teardrop that you uh, moved around with this one action. And this teardrop here, this, this, this peak here, that is how in the local normal form the parabolic stuff looks like. And they come naturally, I mean, when you have hyperbolic points, so um, it doesn't make sense to forbid them because when you forbid it, you, you cannot have these kind of flaps and they're quite natural. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, same thing here. I mean, you can also have so-called swallowtails or pleats and you get them a little, uh, you get them by, if you just take, let's see the boundary and you drag the boundary inside. So it's it's really like a, when, when you consider it, let's say as a cable and you get here some kind of a kink in the cable that you have to um, unfold. And then again, I mean, you get here a hyperbolic regular line with double tori. Here you get parabolic points and so on. So the image gets much more complicated. But we see that uh, this picture here is actually the best you can have. I mean, it can get much worse. Okay, then, so I mean, the theorem we then actually proved uh, was uh, when we have a full image manifold and given any kind of effective hematoin as one action, then you can find an, a smooth uh, H such that here, both functions together give you a hypersymmetric system, meaning only non degenerate singularities plus maybe a parabolic ones. Okay. Why is that thing now doing stupid things? Mm. I mean, here I should maybe say something the following. I mean, we went, I mean, our approach was we admit all kinds of non-agent singularities, so hyperbolics are welcome. 
in order to uh, avoid bad degeneracies. One could also do it the other way around. I mean, I know that I think Daniela Sip and uh, Sue Tolman are working on an approach where you avoid hyperbolic uh, singularities in favor of having something that is badly, badly, badly degenerate. I mean, their advantage seems to be that by avoiding hyperbolic stuff, they don't have this kind of branching of the of the image of the momentum map. And uh, depending on what you want to do, this is, can be nice, but me coming from dynamical system originally, for me uh, saying no hyperbolic, <laughs> this is just a no-go. I mean, the hyperbolic stuff is uh, in cl classical dynamic systems generic usually, and to say, oh, I don't want to have generic stuff. Nah. Okay, so I mean, from Joy and my point of view, I mean, this hypersymmetric systems are just the nicest class to, to lift such an uh, S1 action tool to get something into Google. Okay, and uh, now let's maybe see what's hap was happening during the last one or two years. And as I already said, the picture here of the flap and with the swallowtail, this is the nicest situation you can have in your hyperbolic, the easiest. So, I mean, the question was, how bad can it become? And uh, if you start out now with the way we got semi-torque systems by get, taking uh, whatever the octagon and uh, perturbing it, can we also get some hyper semi stuff? And here, I mean, my PhD student, uh, Yannick Gullentops worked on it and he quite easily <laughs> got all, th all th kind of things, flaps, swallowtails, collisions of them and so on and so on. And I can also nicely trace them. So, I mean, here you have a plot on the reduced space, meaning um, how to explain it. I mean, this here is an, okay, here, let's let's start here. I mean, instead of only double tori, you could also have tori that are, where you have three tori stacked on each other. So three stack tori, let's call it. These three stack tori, when you just take here the cross section, this is this kind of, um, well, Three, to, uh, three figure eight uh, loop, what you technically have. And you can see this in this picture. And this picture is, um, you look at the fiber, you go to the um, reduced space and you plot there where the singularities are. And here the, the, the how should I say, um, reddish thing here, there are these lines here. And when you trace this, I mean here one loop, next loop and then this loop here is just folded above it because I mean we, we are here in, in a chart that has two um, points that are not covered in the space and so this really shows you get these kind of things and then I mean the question came well okay how many tori can we stack on each other and the answer is funny <laughs> for this uh, toric system for this octagon system uh, we can cannot get any uh, we cannot get 14 of them stacked together. So the worst case is 13. We tried it up to, I think, four or five to really uh, explicitly hunt them down. Then we somehow didn't do it anymore. But you can prove it properly. And the main reason behind the whole thing here is that um, these singularities here, they are described by uh, equations. And actually, uh, in local coordinates, these equations are polynomials. And as a polynomial, I mean, we know the degree. Once you know the degree, uh, you know how many uh, how many zeros it can have. And once you know that the zeros correspond to your um, to your uh, hy uh, hyperbolic uh, points or, and elliptic point and so on, you can just check how many zeros do I have. Worst case, given the the degree of the polynomial, then you know how many of these crosses here you can have, and then you know how many stacks you can have. So this uh, <laughs> was a surprising. Uh, so the um, result. Another thing which one also can do, this is still in progress. And uh, I should say, we finished the math before Christmas, but then somehow Yannick got a job and I uh, was swamped with uh, administrative things. So we did not yet write the introduction and couldn't put it onto the archive. What one also can do is one can classify actually fibers in the very stupid way that I was drawing it here. Take a fiber, divide out the S1 action. This gives you one of these things. And now you want to somehow drag along some labels to tell you, I mean, 
is this a hyperbolic comes does this come from a hyperbolic point or not because what i didn't show you here in this picture is could also have uh, tori that are um so they twisted that have a twist and when they have a twist somehow you end up here with a teardrop instead of let's say um a nice figure eight or something like that and so you need to have some additional information to distinguish it from let's say um tori that have a that come from parabolic points but so I'm just with taking the here simply the quotient plus uh, putting a couple of labels on it, you can actually classify in a combinatorial way all fibers of hyper, hyper hypersymmetric systems. And I only just say fiber, I don't say anything about the neighborhood. So this is different from what uh, um, Fomenko and his school did with the molecules and the atoms. They also keep track of what's happening in the neighborhood, and we don't give a care about the neighborhood. We just want to give, get a combinatorial uh, idea of what can happen. Okay, and my time is al almost done, but I'm also almost at the end of my talk. So, I mean, the question now is what what is at the moment happening? And I mean, there's a bunch of projects going on. I mean, one of my PhD students here, uh, I mean, Pedro Santos, he's looking into displaceability of fibers of hypersymmetric systems. And the reason why this makes sense is, is um, in symplectic geometry, when you look there, I mean, Lagrangian submanifolds are very special submanifolds. And the question if you can displace them with an Hamiltonian diffeomorphism or not relates to rigidity questions. And for toric vibrations, so for displacing tori, there's a bunch of results. And if you have an integral with systems, the fibers are actually um, Lagrangian, I mean, as long as they are regular. And so it makes sense to say, well, okay, if I have a toric system and I can displace or non-displace fibers there, what about semi-toric or hyper-semi-toric? And this is uh, what Petro is at the moment looking into. Another point is um, these integra integrability questions or dynamic quest dynamic question very often were first um, studied for the symplectic side of the story, but many things you can also formulate on the contact side for contact geometry. And by forward, I mean uh, Deson did the classification of um, torus actions uh, in the symplectic situations of Hamil uh, but uh, I think Lerman about two or three years later did it for um, the contact side. And so it makes sense to see in how much these systems actually could or would generalize. And this is uh, what Zen is working on at the moment. I mean, together with uh, Eva Miranda, uh, I have a joint PhD student, this is Joachim. And I mean, as part of his uh, PhD topic, together also with uh, Paul Mir, we're looking at uh, if it makes sense to be semi toric in a bisymplectic world. I mean, what, how do we formulate it? Does it make sense? What kind of singularities can you expect or not? What, what is easy, what is not, and so on. And uh, I mean, a paper with, with two or three explicit examples is almost done and should hopefully be in the on the archive over one or two weeks. Another thing is, um, this has a little bit more, let's say, impact for the future. I mean, in the classification of semi toric systems, the Taylor series invariant was a crucial point. And so, of course, comes the, comes the question I mean, Taylor series invariant for focus focus, fine. What about, let's say, flaps? Do flaps have some, tail, uh, some Taylor series invariant? So, I mean, technically, can I, does the vibration near some hyperbolic regular points uh, also can be measured by means of a Taylor series expansion or something like that? And this is an ongoing PhD uh, topic with, um, uh, I mean, of uh, Tobias Henriksen, and he's a joint PhD student with Nikolai Martinchuk and uh, Holger Walkens in Groningen. And with that, I mean, we get here actually to the big plan or aim for the next years. So the question actually, can we in a nice way classify hypersymmetric systems based somehow on how we know that symmetric stuff was classified and this is actually a symplectic classification or can some things not be done symplectically because I mean for parabolic points for example I mean there is uh, I think there there are at the moment so far Nikolai Patinchuk proved uh, smooth uh, normal forms and 
I don't think they can be necessarily make totally uh, symplectic and so on. So this this is, uh, I mean, some other question for the more or less near future, what one can there do. And with that, I would like to thank the audience <laughs> for their attention. Thanks. Thank you, Sonia. Well, I hope it was possible to follow it after the mess with the slides in the beginning. I mean, no problem. Yeah. Okay, got got. It's fine. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> no idea what was going on here. I mean, <laughs> so are there questions? You can just unmute yourself and ask if you want. Yeah, I have a very short question. I may have missed something to go back a couple of slides. Okay, let's hope um, that it doesn't fresh when, yeah. when I do it. <laughs> okay, to where should Your I go? Your theorem about you know going from S1 actions to the integral to, to integrable systems. That um, one here? No, the one before. Yeah, this one. This one, okay. So did you did you say anything about the ambiguity that you have on H or the non-uniqueness or how these things are related? No, we did not yet. I mean, we were happy to find something and <laughs> then we celebrated, wrote the paper and uh, we did not yet check if the thing we found is the optimal one. I mean, uh -huh. this, uh, I, I mean, how should I put it? I mean, it also may be possible to do it to, uh, in a different way. I mean, how, how should I put it? I mean, I mean behind that, there's more of the story. I mean, which I skipped to, uh, since I didn't have uh, feared that I wouldn't have enough time is the following story. I mean, we are not the first one to ask to extend this one action. The very first person to do this was, I think, uh, Kashon in, in 1999, when she classified actually as one actions on four dimension manifolds. And I mean, since on, since she was on four dimension manifolds, this is also one of the reasons why everybody else is now here suddenly on four dimension manifolds. <laughs> And she noticed that, well, okay, I mean, I have an S1 action, effective, blah, 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 and it's classified by a graph. This graph consists of some uh, vertices with sometimes some lines between them, and you have a bunch of fat vertices uh, that stand for um, fixed surfaces and so on. And then she found easily a condition that one could also easily read from the graph if she, she could lift uh, an S1 action to a torus action. So extends to toric. So find a second one that is toric, a second one that is also an S1 action such that both together T2 action. And yep, uh, she gave an explicit construction. And then, I mean, a couple of years later, when I was a postdoc in Lausanne with Tudoratio, Silvia Sabatini was also there. And then, I mean, the, at that time, this classification of the semi toric systems was still very new. And at some point, Tudor asks Silvia and me if we would have some idea how actually that classification relates to uh, Carchon's classification. And we said, uh, no idea. And then Tudor said something like, well, I'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> and then together, um, uh, Daniele Sepe, Silvia Sabatini, and I managed to show how to recover um, uh, the Carchon's classification from the other one. So how they, they are somehow related. But mm -hmm. then on the other hand, you automatically would like to ask, well, okay, how can we go back? So, I mean, how do we extend? And then we fiddle a little bit around and uh, got a very good impression of what to do. And we're also joined by Margaret Symington in this endeavor. And then we had the geometric condition also, which you can read easily from Kashon's graph when you can do it. And then somehow the worst thing happened was that, I mean, Silvia, Daniela and I are more or less of the same age and we more or less at the same time got permanent positions and we loaded this teaching. <laughs> and so somehow that paper never really got written down. We know how to do it. We gave a bunch of talks about it. So there are a bunch of slides floating around proving how to do this. But so far, at some point, we should sit together and just write it down. And I mean, that somehow then gives you, I mean, tells you in which situation we could lift and the worst thing was actually coming from Cachon's, action, uh, Cachon's classification were um, actions that had three uh, 
three horizontal lines above each other. With that, I mean that technically, I mean, there were a bunch of, there were too many stabilizers. And this too many, I mean, is that the so-called set, set case spheres that, that are the stabilizers, I mean, they get mapped under the lifting or under extension to an integral system to the boundary of the uh, of the polygon. And when you lift, if you when you want to lift to something toric, I mean, to a toric um, integral system has a nice polygon with straight edges. So this in particular means that you only can have two uh, at one point. Uh, I mean, I mean, in only have two um, set case spheres floating around. Same thing for semi-toric. I mean, you still have a polygon. You cannot cope with three. And here now, let's maybe hunt, go back to the picture with, where is it here? When you now look here, exactly. I mean, consider, think that this one gives you a stabilizer in that case here. Think that this one gives you a stabilizer somehow. And you want to have a third one somewhere here. And then the trick is how we did it is we do here a blow up. So we cut that thing off, cut that thing off, and then we count that edge here in the middle. So you need to get somewhere in the middle some edges. And this you only get when you put in here hyperbolic stuff some way. I mean, the hyperbolic things themselves, they don't count. So you need to create them artificially. And so we were happy that we found something. And who knows, maybe you can find it differently, but we never cared. Because I mean, the paper had already, I think, 70 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so anybody who wants to optimize on that or wants to classify them, be welcome. <laughs> okay, thanks. Any other question? Okay, I don't see. No. May I? Uh, I actually have to have another com uh, comment or a remark. Mm -hmm. sure. This is uh, not directly related to my talk. More, uh, it's a, it's just advertisement for conference. So I mean, this is here. My talk was about integrable systems, and uh, the integrable systems community always is meeting every two years at the big uh, F this conferences, the finite dimensional integral systems, and now it is summer in uh, in August. We meet. Uh, this conference takes place in, in Antwerp. So um, when you go to my webpage, <laughs> you will find <laughs> uh, all the information and the registration deadline in particular for I think contributed talk and talks and uh, funded accommodation for junior people is on the 16th of April. So please spread the word in case somebody's uh, okay. interested. In you, this, uh... you, if you have an announcement email, you can you can send it or forward it to me and I'll- ah, Perfect, perfect, you, perfect. You know. I do that, I do that. So I mean, I mean, we send it through a couple of lists, but uh, unfortunately, I think the educable systems community doesn't really have their own one, and there's also a lot of people sometimes just uh, floating by. And uh, <laughs> I think our list is extremely comprehensive. We have more than a thousand good. people in the list. This is good. This is perfect. <laughs> I see that Simone has raised her hand. Yeah, I would just like to know whether there has been a particular studies of those action on the Kodai Hathurston compact symplectic four-dimensional manifold. I mean, we we haven't done it. This is something you may, maybe should... Uh, let's play like that. I know that Joey Palmer and Johan de Floch they are right now working on one or two papers and they announced that they have a bunch of more nice examples, but did not yet <laughs> disclose <laughs> what these examples actually are. But there's a certain chance that they are busy with that. I mean, otherwise, I also know that in algebraic geometry, a bunch of people is busy with um, some kind of algebraic geometry version of semi-toric systems. So they also may, may work on that. I mean, you could check what um, what's his name. I think Hen Henrik Süskind, he may be in Jena, I think, in the meanwhile, what he's doing. I know that he asked me some, uh, a somewhat similar question a couple of years ago. Okay, and I have another question. Has it been studied when the two vector fields, the two commuting vector fields mm -hmm. that you are considering are related, for instance, if there is a compatible, almost complex structure which sends one on the other, or has this not been... I mean, we, we have not yet uh, 
considered it and I mean so uh, not as far as I know I think okay thanks thanks so, Okay, so if there are no further questions, maybe you can thank Tony again. Thanks, thanks a lot. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. I'll see you guys next time. Okay. Next time, ciao. Bye.